Today, we are going to talk about the first video of the Cobla series entitled Obligations. Before anything else, we would like to inform you that all information from this video will be coming from the book of Hector de Leon entitled Obligations and Contracts. Now, what is law and obligations and contracts? The law of obligation and contracts is the body of rules which deals with the nature and sources of obligations and the rights and duties arising from agreements and the particular contracts. Meanwhile, we ask ourselves, what is law in general? Law means any rule of action or any system of uniformity, and it determines not only the activities of men as rational beings, but also the movements or motions of all objects of creation. There are two general divisions of law. First is the law in the strict legal sense, which is enforced by the state, and second is the law in the non-legal sense, which is not promulgated and enforced by the state. Moreover, there are two concepts of law. First is the general, which is all the laws taken together, and second is specific, which is conduct, just, and obligatory. There are four characteristics of law. First is the rule of conduct, what shall be done and not. Second, it is obligatory, it is a positive command, duty to obey, and involved sanctions. Third, it is promulgated by legitimate authorities. An example of it would be the statutes, which is the legislative branch. And fourth, common observation and benefit. Law is intended by man to serve man. Necessity and functions of law. What would life be without law? Society becomes into existence because its members could not live without it. The need for internal order is as constant as the need for external defense. What does law do? Law secures justice, resolves social conflict, orders society, protects interests, and controls social relations. What is our duty as members of society? No society can last and continue without means of social control. Every citizen should have some understanding of law and observe it for the common good. Sources of Law The first source is the Constitution. Second is the Legislation. Third is the administrative or executive orders, regulations, and rulings. Fourth source is the judicial decisions or jurisprudence. Fifth source is custom. And lastly, other sources. The organization of courts in the Philippines are divided into three. First is the Philippine judicial system, second is the special courts, and third is the quasi-judicial agencies. An example of the Philippine judicial system or the regular courts will be the Supreme Court. Under the Supreme Court are the Court of Appeals, Regional Trial Courts, and the Metropolitan Trial Courts. For the special courts, it is with limited jurisdiction that deals with the particular field of law rather than a territorial jurisdiction. An example of this would be the Sandigan Bayan. Lastly, for the quasi-judicial agencies, it is under the executive branch, having the possessions of the right to hold hearings on and conduct investigations into disputed claims. The classifications of law are divided into two. First is to as to its purpose, and second is as to its subject matter. For the as to its purpose, under here are substantive law and adjective law, procedural, or remedial law. Substantive law are the set of laws that governs how members of society are to behave. Also, it 
creates and defines rights and duties. Under the adjective law, it deals with the rules of procedure governing evidence, pleading, and practice. It also prescribes the manner or procedure. Further as to its subject matter, the public law regulates the rights and duties arising from the relationship of the state to the people. Under here are criminal law, international law, constitutional law, administrative law, and criminal procedure. Next to its subject matter is the private law which regulates the relations of individuals with one another for purely private ends. Under here are civil law, commercial law, and civil procedure. After tackling the laws and the basic terms of it, we now move on to obligation. What is an obligation? Obligation is a judicial necessity to give, to do, or not to do. Juridical relation where a creditor may demand from the debtor and any case of breach may obtain satisfaction from the assets of the latter. The four elements of an obligation are active subject, passive subject, object, and juridical tie. If there are sources of law, there are also sources of obligation. And under here are first law, second contracts, third quasi-contracts, fourth delicts, and fifth quasi-delicts. A law is one of the main sources of obligation since obligations are derived from law that are not presumed. Only those expressed in the civil law are demandable and shall be regulated by the precepts of the law which establish them. Second, contracts is a source of obligation since it has the force of law between the contracting parties and should be compiled within good faith. Contracts is also a meeting of minds between two parties where one binds himself with respect to another to give, to, or not to do something. Next is the quasi-contracts or quasi-contract 2. It arises from certain lawful, voluntary, and unilateral acts that no one may be unjustly enriched at the expense of another. The fourth source of obligation is the delicts. It is governed primarily by the penal laws. And lastly, for the sources of obligation is the quasi-delicts or quasi-maleficio. Whoever by act or omission causes damage to another, there being fault or negligence, is obligated to pay for the damage done if there is no pre-existing contractual relation between the parties. Moving on, fault or negligence is an omission of the diligence required by nature of the obligation and corresponds with the circumstances of the person, time, and place. An obligation to give, we have the specific and generic things. A specific or determinate thing can be distinguished from others of its kind. There is the obligation to preserve the thing with the proper diligence of a good father of a family unless the law or party requires another standard of care, which is extraordinary diligence provided in the stipulation of parties. There is the obligation to deliver the fruits, but the creditor has no real right over it until it's delivered. The obligation to deliver the accession and accessories, even though it was not mentioned. Here, the creditor may compel the debtor to make the delivery. Second, for the generic or indeterminate thing, it is indicated by its kinds without being distinguished from others of its kind. Here, the creditor may ask that the obligation be complied with at the expense of the debtor. Under the obligation to do, obligations shall be executed at his cost if the person obliged to do something fails to do it, or he does it in contravention to the tenor of the obligation. It may be decreed that what has been done be poorly done, be undone. Law does not authorize the imposition of personal force or coercion upon the debtor to comply with his obligation and can still be held liable for damages.
under the obligation not to do, if the obligor does what he was not supposed to do, it will be done at his expense and can be held liable for damages. The remedies of the creditor, when the debtor fails to comply with his obligation, the creditor may avail himself of action for specific performance, action to resign the obligation, and action for damages. The following are the damages. The first one being fraud, which is deliberate and intentional evasion of normal fulfillment of obligation and moral solvendi ex persona, which is default in personal obligations. Second, we have moral accipiendi, which is delay on the part of the creditor to accept performance of obligation. The creditor is liable for damages and bears the risk of loss of the thing, while the debtor is not liable for interest from the time of the creditor's delta release from obligation. Third, we have compensation more, which is the delay of the obligor in reciprocal obligation. And under this, we have ordinary delay, which is the failure to perform obligation at appointed time, and legal delay or default, which is tantamount to non-fulfillment of the obligation and arises after extrajudicial or judicial demand was made upon the debtor. This is not necessary when the obligation or law says so, the period is a controlling motive, and demand is useless. Under force majeure, we have fortuitous events which are not foreseen or inevitable. This is applicable only to obligations to give a specific thing an obligation to do, and the debtor cannot be held liable for damages for non-performance. However, the debtor is still liable if it is expressly specified by law, it was declared by stipulation, and when the nature of the obligation requires the assumption of risk. The following must happen to exempt the debtor from paying damages. First is the cost of unforeseen occurrence or failure to comply with its obligations must be independent of the human will. Second, it, it was impossible to foresee or avoid. Third, is it impossible for the debtor to fulfill his obligation in a normal matter. Fourth, the obligation must be free from any participation in the aggravation of the injury resulting to the creditor. And lastly, fault or negligence must not be imputed to the debtor. The following are the kinds of obligations. Pure, conditional, with a term, alternative, joint, solidary, divisible, and indivisible. Under pure obligation, it is with no term or condition which depends on the fulfillment of the obligation contracted by the debtor. This must be reasonable construed, distinguishing immediate demandability by the creditor from the fulfillment by the debtor for which a reasonable period may be granted. A conditional obligation, on the other hand, is when every future and uncertain event upon which an obligation or provision is made to depend. There are seven classifications of a conditional obligation. The first one being suspensive, where the happening of the condition gives rise to an obligation. Second is resolutory, where happening of the condition extinguishes rights already existing. Third is protestative, which depends on the will of the one of the contracting parties, and here we have the simple one, which presupposes not only manifestation of will, but the realization of an external act, and purely, which depends solely and exclusively upon the will. Fourth, we have the causal classification, which depends on the will of the third person and not the contracting parties. Next, we have mix, which depends on the will of the debtor, but also upon chance or will of others. Six is positive, where an event happening at a determinate time will extinguish the obligation as soon as the time expires or becomes clear that the event will not take place. And lastly, negative, where an event not happening at a determinate time will render the obligation as effective from the moment the time has elapsed. Obligations for the period. An op- um, a period is a space of time which exerting an influence on obligations as a consequence of a juridical act suspends their demandability or determines their extinguishment. This is future, certain, and possible. It has no effect on the existence of obligations but only the demandability or performance. There are 11 kinds of obligation with the period, the first one being suspensive where the period must lapse before the performance of the obligation can be demanded. 
Second is resolutory, where the period after which the performance must be terminated. Third is legal, where the period is fixed by law. Voluntary, where the period is fixed by the parties. Juridical, where the period is allowed by the courts. We also have express, implied, and original. Ninth, we have the period of grace, which is the extension fixed by the parties or the court. Tenth, which is the definite, where it is fixed or known date of time. And lastly, indefinite, where the event that will necessarily happen in the future with an unknown date. The third kind of obligation is the alternative obligation, where we have the plurality of objects. The first one is conjunctive, where the debtor has to perform several prestations and is extinguished only by performance of all of them. Second is alternative, where several objects being due, the fulfillment of one is sufficient. Third is facultative, where only one thing is due, but the debtor has reserved the right to substitute it with another. Next, we have joint and solidary obligations. The joint obligation is where each of the debtor is liable only for a proportionate part of the debt and each creditor is entitled only to a proportionate part of the credit. If the law or the nature of the wording of the obligation does not express anything to the contrary, the joint character of the obligation is presumed. For a solidary obligation, it is one in which each debtor is liable for the entire obligation and each creditor is entitled to demand the whole obligation. There is solidary liability when the obligation expressly so states or when the law or the nature requires solidarity. Solidarity may exist although the creditors and the debtors may not be bound in the same manner and by the same periods of the conditions. This is either active where the solidarity and among the creditors or passive when it is among the debtors. We have the dual character of obligations where the obligation may be joined on the side of each creditor and solidarity on the side of the debtors or vice versa. In such cases, the rules applicable to each subject of the obligation should be applied. Divisible and indivisible obligations refer to the performance of the prestation and not to the thing which the oblig thereof. A divisible obligation is one in which is susceptible to partial performance. An indivisible obligation is where whatever may be the nature of the thing, which is the object thereof, when it cannot be val validly performed in its parts. Here we consider the will of the contracting parties, purpose of the stipulated prestation, the nature of the thing, and provisions of the law affecting the prestation. For obligations to the penal clause, the penal clause is an accessory undertaking which serves a double purpose, to provide for liquidated damages and strengthen the coercive force of the obligation by the threat of greater responsibility in the event of breach. The penalties that substitute the indemnity for damages and the payments of the interests in case of non-compliance, if there is no stipulation to the contrary. Damages besides penalty First is when there is an express provision to that effect, when the debtor refuses to pay the penalty, and when the debtor is guilty of fraud in the non-fulfillment of the obligation. Non-performance gives rise to the presumption of fraud. The following are the provisions. The creditor cannot demand the fulfillment of obligation and the satisfaction of the penalty at the same time, unless the right has been clearly granted him. And the debtor cannot exempt himself from the performance of the obligation by paying the penalty, save in the case where this right has been expressly reserved for him. Lastly, we have the extinguishment of obligations, which are pay by payment of performance, the loss of the thing due, condemnation or remission of the debt, confusion or merger of the rights of the debtor and creditor, and compensation and evasion. Other payment of performance. Payment means not only the delivery of money, but also the performance in any other manner of the obligation. Unless there is an express stipulation to that effect, the creditor cannot com be compelled partially to receive the prestation, neither may the debtor be required to make partial payments. Payment made by the debtor to a wrong party does not extinguish the obligation as to the creditor if there is no fault or negligence which can be imputed to the latter. This should be made when an obligation is due and demandable and to the place designated in the obligation. 
but in any other case, the domicile of the debtor. Under this, we have the Dasha and Pago, which is Nation and Payment. It is the delivery and transmission of ownership of a thing by the debtor to the creditor as an accepted equivalent of the performance of obligation. The property given may consist not only of a thing but also of a real right, such as usufruct, or of a credit against a third person. We also have payment by session. If the debtor is on the verge of insolvency and he has two or more creditors, he may see or assign his property to his creditors in payment of his debts unless the debtor waives the exemption. Lastly, we have tender of payment and co-signation. The tender of payment is the manifestation made by the debtor to the creditor or his desire to comply with his obligation with the offer of immediate performance. Next, we have the loss of the thing due. A thing is lost when it perishes, it goes out of commerce, it disappears in such a way that its existence is unknown or it cannot be recovered. Here the courts here the court shall determine whether under the circumstances the partial loss of the object of the obligation is so important as to extinguish the obligation. This applies to determinate things only, and the cause of loss must be fortuitous and is not on the debtor, while the right of the creditor is subrogated to the right of the debtor against the third person who caused the loss to occur. Next, we have condemnation or remission of the debt. By remission, the creditor renounces the enforcement of the obligation which is extinguished in its entirety or in that part or aspect of the same to which the remission refers. There are three kinds, the first one being form, and under this we have express which is made formally and should be in accordance with the form of ordinary donations and implied. Second, we have extent. Under this, we have total and partial. Partial refers to the amount of indebtedness or to an accessory obligation only, such as pledged or interest, or to some other aspect of the obligation, such as solidarity. Third, this manner, we have inter vivos, which is effective during the lifetime of the creditor, and mortis causa, which is effective upon the death of the creditor, and must be contained in a will or testament. Next, we have the confusion or merger of rights. Here, the characters of the creditor and debtor are merged in the same person. It must take place between the creditor and the principal debtor. The very same obligation must be involved, and the confusion must be total or as regards the entire obligation. The kinds of compensation are facultative, which can be set up only at the option of the creditor when legal compensation cannot take place because of what or some legal requisites of the benefit of the creditor. Conventional when the parties agree to the compensate their mutual obligations, even if some requisite is lacking, such as when the debts are not yet due. And judicial, which is the compensation that takes place when a defendant, who is the creditor of the plaintiff for an unliquidated amount, sets up his credit as a counterclaim against the plaintiff, this credit is liquidated by the judgment, thereby compensating it to the credit of the plaintiff. And lastly, legal, where compensation takes place by operation of law because all of the requisites are present. Lastly, we have novation, which is the extinguishment of an obligation by the substitution or change of obligation by a subsequent one, which extinguishes or modifies the first, either by changing the object or principal conditions substituting the person of the debtor and subrogating the third person in the rights of the creditor. Novation is a juridical act of dual function in that at the time it extinguishes an obligation, it creates a new one in lieu of the old. It has two classifications, the first one as to form and express the extinguishment of the old obligation by the new one must be declared in unequivocal terms implied where the novation is never pursued. Second classification is the effect. Um, we have partial when there is only a modification to some part principle. Second it has to effect and under this we have partial when there is only a modification in some principal conditions of the obligation and total where the old obligation is completely extinguished.
Hello Lasallians, thank you for making it to the end of this video. We truly hope you learned a lot from this episode on obligations. And if you did, please don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell for more educational videos tackling law courses in This, this is Leila Sal. See you on our next video.